why? Why is this happening? Lord, are you asking that question about the things that are going on around all of us as you, you watch the news and you see the, the cases increase and the death toll mount? As, as livelihoods are threatened and you, and you look at the situation and you say, why, Lord, why? But you know, while this global crisis occupies the news cycle, the difficulties of life don't uh, take a vacation. They don't disappear because of this hard thing that's come. And people who have had wayward children still have wayward children. People who have had uh, health crises and health conditions unrelated to the coronavirus still have those things, may be complicated now because they can't get in to see a health care provider or worried because of complications that might arise if they're exposed to the virus. People who have faced the loss of a loved one uh, wholly unrelated to this virus and and yet because it's this time now they don't have the comfort of friends around them to hug them and to hold them and you know when we face life's hardest issues we're almost hardwired to ask the question why why and you know behind that question is an assumption and the assumption is this, that if, that if God could just explain to me what's happening, if he could just tell me in a way that I could understand it, that I could see the sense to it, the justification of it, then I could accept it, I could understand it, I, I could s submit to it, cooperate with it, even embrace it. And when you face the hardest issues of life, you need answers, don't you? Or do you? Today is Easter Sunday. It's the special celebration of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And I say the special celebration because every Sunday is the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. He rose on the first day of the week and the church very early on changed the day of worship from the seventh day to the first day in marking that and in celebrating the start of a new creation. An elder saint today read the account of the resurrection of Jesus from the Gospel of Luke. But what does the resurrection of Jesus mean for you when you face life's hardest issues? I want to read to you today from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 17 through 26. Now, uh, this passage in the Gospel of John happens before Jesus rose from the dead, but what happens here can't really fully be understood except in the light of Jesus' resurrection. And this is the word of God. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Pray with me. Our Father, increase our faith that we may believe 
that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and in believing, have life in him. Amen. When you face the hardest issues of life, you need answers, right? That's what Martha thought. When she heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. And she said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And you know, her statement in saying that is an implicit accusation and it's an implicit question. Why? Why? Why did this happen? Why were you not here? Why would you have allowed this to take place when you could have prevented it? Could it be that she had heard that Jesus had deliberately delayed in coming because he had deliberately delayed in coming? Up at the beginning of the chapter, we read now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that the Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And John tells us there these two incompatible things. It says that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed there for two days. When you face the hardest answers of life, or the hardest questions of life, rather, the hardest issues of life, you need answers. And there were people there who I suspect were willing to provide answers. We're told that Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. Now, you have to understand something about the Gospel of John when John uses this phrase, the Jews. And you have to understand that, um, that, that John is a Jew, that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are Jews, that Jesus and all of his disciples are Jews, that everybody they had anything to do with are Jews. When John uses the word Jews, he's not speaking about an ethnicity. He's speaking about the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the teachers of the law. And there were those who had come, were told, to console them in their loss. And you know what we find as we look at these people, particularly when you look at the conclusion that they draw about Jesus when he's on the cross, is that many of these people thought that they were in God's counsel. That in other words, that they knew the whys and the wherefores, the reasons for which things happened. I mean, they'd study the scriptures after all. They studied them a lot. And because of that, they thought that they could look at the events of providence and they could know the mind of God. Could know why things were happening. And so if you asked them, or sometimes if you didn't, they would tell you why things were happening. Maybe you've known people like that who will look at circumstances in your life, different circumstances, and will be bold to tell you, well, let me tell you why the Lord is doing that. Let me tell you why this is happening. You know, Jesus warned us against reasoning like that. In Luke chapter 13, he says to his disciples, the 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam collapsed upon them, do you think that they were more evil than others in Jerusalem? Because that would have been the thinking of the day that, that they had come to this particularly horrific fate because there was something worse about them than others. Or Jesus' disciples, having been brought up in that environment and learning to think that way, 
in John chapter 9, his disciples saw a man who was born blind from birth, and they said to him, Now, Lord, this man who's born blind, is he blind because of his sin or because of the sin of his parents? And Jesus said, Neither, but it's so that the glory of God may be revealed. You know, when we think of the situation that we're in, we might have similar questions, maybe similar accusations. Lord, Lord, why is this virus happening? Lord, my job or my business was going so well and now it's in tatters, it's in ruins. Why? Or maybe, Lord, I'm facing something that's unrelated to this situation that's hard. But this is making it harder. Why is this happening? Why are you allowing it to happen? And there are those who would confidently proclaim that they have the answer for you, but the wisdom of God tells us otherwise. Ecclesiastes 8.17 says, Then I saw all that God had done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can understand its meaning. Even if a wise man should claim that he knows, he cannot really understand it. Uh, J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, which is a book that, that every Christian should read somewhere along their Christian journey, and it would be better to read it earlier rather than later, uh, tells this uh, this analogy for the wisdom of the book of Ecclesiastes and wisdom in general and understanding the wisdom that we gain from God. And because he's a Brit, he talks about being on the platform of the York train station. And he said, if you stand there, you're going to see trains moving inexplicably here and there uh, from this track to that track on and off. He said, and it won't make any sense to you. He said, but if you happen to know one of the higher ops and you're privileged to be taken up into the York signal box, there up on the wall will be a map for miles out uh, with an electronic indication of where all the trains are, the inbound trains, the outgoing trains, and what's going on. He said, and at a moment, when you look at that map, he said, all of a sudden you can make sense of the movement of the trains that you see right there from the platform. You see that there's a reason for it. It makes sense. And Packer writes, the mistake that is commonly made is to suppose that the gift of wisdom consists in a deepening insight into the providential meaning and purpose of events going on around us. People feel that if they were really walking close to God so that he could impart wisdom to them freely, then they would, so to speak, find themselves in the signal box. Such people spend much time poring over the book of Providence, wondering why God should have allowed this or that to take place. And Packer goes on to explain that Christian wisdom doesn't work that way that it's not like being in the signal box, that it's much more like, Packer says, learning how to drive. That when you learn to drive, you learn to navigate and to negotiate the road that's in front of you. And you really don't stop to consider why the road gets rough here or why it's turtle back there or why it makes a hairpin turn there. Why is really not the issue. The issue is, can I navigate this skillfully? Can I navigate this safely? And Packer points out rightly that that really is what Christian wisdom is. Skillfully, righteously, rightly dealing with the situations that come up. Not being able to have an insight into God's secret counsel as to why. I'm going to tell you that the truth is that when you face the hardest issues of life, issues of life and death, you don't need answers. You need Jesus. And Jesus, you notice here in our passage, doesn't respond to Martha's accusation or, or answer her implicit question, why? He makes a statement to her. He says, your brother will rise again. Now, you know, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees did. 
and the common people generally believed in the resurrection. The prophet Isaiah had said, your dead shall live, their bodies will rise. Daniel was told uh, toward the end of his book that, that those who sleep in the dust of the ground would awake. And Martha believed that. And so she said to Jesus, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection of the last day. She knew that. She believed it. She had faith in it. And she knew that and believed it and had faith in it before Jesus came. Before he had come to their home in Bethany and before she had ever met him. If, if that was what was to bring her comfort, the knowledge of that, well, then, then Jesus needn't have come at all. She already knew that. But, but her pain was in that her beloved brother was gone. And she had believed that Jesus loved him too. They had sent word to Jesus in verse 3, Lord, the one you love is sick. But he delayed in coming. And now it was too late. Why? Where were you? If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Are you asking questions like that? Maybe you're facing the hardest issue of your life right now. It's all gone wrong. It's gone bad. And where's God? Where's he been? You need answers, don't you? If you could just understand it, if it could just be explained to you in a way that would make sense, then you would embrace it. You would accept it. You'd submit to it, but it just makes no sense to you. Let me say it again. When you face the hardest issues of your life, you don't need answers. You need Jesus. And today we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. But, you know, when Jesus rose from the dead, it wouldn't be like the rising of Lazarus. If we read to the end of chapter 11, we'd read about the, 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 the raising of Lazarus. The resurrection of Jesus was not like the rising of the son of the widow at Nain. Now, when Jesus rose, he was never to die again. Death would not have mastery over him. Uh, he was to rise as the start of the new creation uh, to which all of the rest of redeemed creation will one day catch up. But I want you to look at what Jesus says here. When Mary says, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection. He doesn't say, I will be resurrected. He doesn't say, I will bring resurrection to others. He says, I am the resurrection. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asks her, do you believe this? He doesn't ask her, did Lazarus believe this? He said, do you believe this? When it comes to the hardest issues of your life, the hardest things that you face, do you really think that explanations would satisfy you? See, Jesus didn't come to give you explanations. He came to give you himself. 
And when you face the hardest issues of life, you don't need answers. You need Jesus. Uh, all that you long for, all that will satisfy you, all that can comfort, help, and heal you and fulfill you, none of those things will be found in an answer. But all of them will be found in Jesus. The Lord is risen. I didn't hear that congregation. The Lord is risen. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, will live, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asked Martha, do you believe this? He doesn't ask her if Lazarus believed it. What matters for Martha at that moment is, Martha, do you believe this? I am the resurrection and the life. And Jesus still asks the question, do you believe this? It doesn't matter how Martha answered. It matters how you answer. I am the resurrection. Do you believe this? Do you? When you face the hardest issues of life, you don't need answers. You need Jesus. Let's pray together, church. Our Father, thank you for your great love and goodness to us. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the resurrection and the life, and in you is all that can help, all that can heal, and all that can satisfy us. Father, may we be content with Jesus and not look for answers which would never satisfy, but to see that in him you've provided for us all that we need. And in him we'll rejoice. Amen.